Alright, welcome to lesson three. Uh, today we're going to look at exponents. This is going to be a real serious review um, of some things that you are very familiar with. Um, and then we're going to look at the relationship between exponential and logarithmic functions. That will also be a review of things um, that you are very familiar with. And we're going to solve some exponential equations. Um, we're going to learn a couple of new properties um, that will kind of help you do that. Uh, without a calculator in some cases. And then we're going to look at the inverse of exponential functions, which is just applying a little bit of the new terminology about inverses that we've reviewed uh, to exponential functions. So while it might seem like that's um, a lot of new stuff, it's really going to be just a couple of extensions of things that you are already very familiar with. All right, time for us to look at the properties of exponents. Um, this is a review of some pretty common principles, so if you feel confident about this, maybe take a look at them quickly, pause the video, um, try a couple of examples, uh, you can then move on. Um, but if you are feeling a little bit um, sketchy or just want a little review, I'm going to go over these and do a couple of pretty quick examples, and there will of course be some um, more uh, problems for you to try in the assignment. All right, so first and foremost, if I have um, b to the n times b to the m, meaning my bases are the same, and that's kind of a common theme um, for the first three, or the first two, um, then I can write it as b, the same base, uh, to the power n plus m. And as a simple example, let's try 4 squared times 4 to the third, and that is going to be 4 to the fifth. And I can think about this, 4 squared is 4 times 4, 4 to the third is 4 times 4 times 4, so when I multiply them together, I'll have 4 times 4 times 4 times 4 times 4, which is 4 times itself 5 times, or 4 to the fifth. Similarly, if I have uh, b to the n divided by b to the m, I can subtract the exponents and write it in terms of one base. And so another example, if I have 4 to the third power divided by 4 to the second power, this is 4 to the 3 minus 2, or 4 to the first power. And this should be also pretty simple, right? 4 times 4 times 4, divided by 4 times 4. I'll actually write that out. And 4 over 4 is 1 over 1, 4 over 4 is 1 over 1, and so I'm left with 4. Alright, if I have b to the n, then all raised to the m power, I can simply write it as one exponent where I multiply them together. And similarly, if I can, this is a good way of going back and forth, if I have b to the n times m, so if I can write the exponent as something times something else, I can then rewrite it as b to the n to the m. Um, so I'll look, um, give us a couple of uh, examples here. First, very simple, if I have 4 squared to the third power, that's 4 to the sixth. Okay? And you can think of this as being 4 squared times itself three times. So I have 4 squared times 4 squared times 4 squared, add up all the exponents, 2 plus 2 plus 2 is 6. All right, this is also very helpful um, in another scenario. So imagine I had 4 to the 3 over 2. And so here I can write 3 over 2 as a product of two numbers. So I can write 4 to the 1 half times 3. And so when I have an exponent written as two um, numbers multiplied by each other, I can raise the base to one of them and then raise the whole thing to another. So I can write this as 4 to the 1 half all raised to the third power. And 4 to the 1 half, the square root of 4, is 2, and so that's 2 to the third, which is 8. Okay? So it can help me simplify um, in many different ways. Alright, uh, next one is pretty straightforward. If I have a divided by b all raised to the nth power, I can apply the power to both the numerator and denominator independently. And this makes uh, should make pretty perfect sense. If I have 2 thirds to the fourth power, I can write that as 2 to the fourth over 3 to the fourth. 
And the way to think about this is if you have this fraction times itself four times, you have two-thirds times two-thirds times two-thirds times two-thirds times two-thirds. And when you're multiplying fractions, you multiply the numerators and multiply the denominators. So you'd have two times two times two times two, two to the fourth, over three times three times three times three, three to the fourth. And that can um, help you simplify because you can compute two to the fourth and three to the fourth. Or you can go the other way. Okay. Last but not least, if I have a negative power, I can write it as 1 over the same base to the positive version of that power. Uh, I'm not going to spend the time in this video uh, proving why that is, but I encourage you um, to either go back, look at um, the video that I made uh, on properties of exponents where I go over it, or discuss it with your fellow classmates. Um, or go online and do some research yourself, or try and prove it yourself, um, and we can talk about it at a later date. But this is helpful, so for example, if I have 2 to the negative third power, that is the same as 1 over 2 to the third power. Okay. Similarly, if I had 1 half all raised to the negative third, third power, this is a little different, I would have 1 divided by 1 half to the positive third power. Okay, And you could actually go ahead and using some of the properties we've talked about, you could compute this and uh, rewrite this. So 1 half to the third is 1 to the third over 2 to the third using this property here. And so that's 1 over 8 <clears throat> and when you're dividing by a fraction, you can multiply by the reciprocal. So you would end up with 1 times 8 over 1, which is 8. All right, that was a quick refresher, and we're going to use these. Uh, I mean, you'll use them all over the place, um, so you just want to have uh, some familiarity with those. All right, to uh, hop into our next uh, topic, um, here is a question for you to try. All right, now this should look familiar, and in order to solve this, you don't need a whole lot of tricky mathematical operations. Notice that you're solving, you're trying to figure out what does this exponent need to be um, so that when I raise 3 to that power, I get 81. And you can think about it, right? 3 to the 1, well, that's 3. 3 to the 2, or 3 squared, is 9. 3 to the 3rd is 3 times 3 times 3, or 27. And then if you multiply by 3 one more time, 3 to the 4th, you'd have 3 times 3 times 3 times 3. And this is 9. 9 times 3 is 27. 27 times 3 is 81. Okay? Now, what we want to do is think about the mindset or the question that we ask ourselves or that we want to be asking when we're looking to solve this equation. And the question that we should be asking ourselves is, what must I raise 3 to the power of to get 81? Or, what power should I raise 3 to to get 81? And the way that we write that mathematically, the operation is called finding the logarithm. Shorthand, we use log. So to say that, we'd say log base 3, what must I raise a base of 3 to to get 81? And so mathematically, asking that question is writing this statement. Log base 3 of 81 is telling you it is to find the power that you must raise 3 to in order to get 81. Or in other words, what is the value that you raise 3 to the power of and it gives you 81? And so this is going to be very helpful because a computer can find this really quickly. In fact, for situations that are not as cut and dry as 3 and 81, um, it would take us potentially a very long time. All right, so this leads us to the idea of how we can rewrite an exponential function or equation in terms of a logarithm. So if I have, and I'll take you through this step by step, so don't worry. If I have an equation y equals b to the x, and this is saying the base b raised to the power x equals y. Now if I want to solve this for x, what I'm asking is, what must I raise b to the power of to get y? And the way that I write that is log base b of y. The way I say that, log base b of y. And log, of course, is short for the word logarithm. 
So if you have an exponential equation, then you can rewrite it where you've solved for the exponent because the exponent is exactly the exponent that you must raise b to the power of to get y. Okay? b is known as the base of your logarithm and y is the argument of your logarithm. Okay, So make sure you write it like this where y is on the same level as the logarithm and b is the base. This is not b to the y. Notice that b is written much smaller than y is. You don't want to confuse yourself in that way. And we can go the other way too, right? So we can say, look, if you have some value that is equivalent to log base b of y, well, then what you're saying is, look, this value is the value that you raise b to the power of to get y. So if you take that value, which is equal to x, and you raise b to that power, b to the x will equal y. Okay? And so notice that I can go either way. Right? If I have an exponential equation, I can write it as a logarithmic equation. And if I have a logarithmic equation, then I can write it as an exponential equation. So the quick way to write this is just to say you can go either way. y equals b to the x. Then you can write it as x equals log base b of y. Or you could go the other way. If you had x equals log base b of y, you could then rewrite it as y equals b to the x. And this is going to be very helpful when we are solving for exponents, right? If you need to figure out what an exponent is, what you're asking is to find the logarithm. And your calculator can do this very quickly. All right, remember, log base b of y is finding the value that you must raise b to the power of to get y. All right, so I've included all of the uh, information that we just covered right above here. Um, and remember, the basic principle of logarithms is that it is another way to write an exponential um, equation. So if you have y equals b to the x, you can rewrite it in terms of x, where x is the value that you must raise b to the power of to get y, which is exactly log base b of y. And you can go the other way as well. So um, we now need to discuss something called Euler's number. Now, as you will remember, Euler's number is irrational, meaning it goes on forever and ever, and we'll never be able to stop. Um, science, mathematicians have calculated millions of digits along uh, the way. And uh, you can notice that it's approximately 2.718. 2818, so on and so forth, and it does not, there's no repeating pattern. So you might think to yourself, oh, it's 7, and then it's 1828, and then it's 18 again, and then it's going to go 2. No, it doesn't. So don't worry, you can go ahead and look it up. It, it will not. Um, and you can actually kind of calculate this yourself. And I want to quickly go over how he came up with this number. Um, it, you can do a little more research uh, of this on your own, and you can. There are some um, great YouTube videos on uh, actually proving Euler's number, and I encourage you to take a look at them. Um, there's also a good one on Khan Academy, um, but it will be easier for us to understand once we introduce uh, the first topic in our calculus class, um, and maybe then we'll go back and. Um, and take a look at it, okay? So uh, I want to briefly go over how he came up with it. So what Euler did is he looked at this expression. 1 plus 1 over n to the nth power. And he started plugging in values for n. So he started with 1, okay? So you can try it. Try it when n is equal to 1. And there, what you end up with is 1 plus 1 over 1, which is 2, and 2 to the 1 is 2. So you end up with 2. All right. And he kept trying bigger and bigger values. So he tried you know, 10, and you could keep going. Try 10, try 100, try 1,000, try a million, right? And as the values of n got bigger and bigger and bigger, he found that 
the value of this expression was getting closer and closer and closer to this number. And uh, this is what we call Euler's number. So at 100, you would get 2.7048, approximately, 2.7048, so on and so forth. And you could try bigger and bigger values of n, and you'll find that you get closer and closer uh, to this value here. Okay? And um, e is very special um, because this happens to be uh, a very important um, way of writing something that is continuously growing by a certain percentage. And we can go over that more um, at a different time, but you can also look up um, some, some good videos. There's a good one on Khan Academy about uh, how that makes sense. And maybe you could figure it out on your own as well. And we're going to work a lot with Euler's constant. And so it, Euler's constant is used a lot as the base of an exponent. And so if you have e to the x, meaning this number, 2.71 and so on and so forth, um, to the x, you can rewrite it as x is equal to log base e of y. Right? Because what you're wondering is what is the power that you raise e to to get y? And that is exactly what log base e of y is asking. And this has a special name when you have a logarithm where your base is e. This is what's called the natural logarithm. And so you could rewrite this as x equals ln of y. And you don't have to put the parentheses there, just like I don't have to put the parentheses there, and I, I usually don't. Um, but this will help you remember that it's, it's ln of y instead of just writing ln y and maybe confusing yourself and thinking that you're you know, going to New York or something like that. And so this is what's called the natural logarithm, or the natural log for short. And you can write it as ln, or you can write it as log base e if that helps you remember what that's referring to. Some people, and I bet you too many people that have, have gone on to uh, you know, take math in college, forget that the natural log is log base e, meaning you're wondering what you must raise e to in order to get some value. Okay? And it's always helpful. You can approximate um, by thinking of e as being a number that's a little less than 3. Uh, so, you know, if you were trying to find log base e of 9, for example, let's just do that over here, log base e of 9. So, if, you, if the base were 3, well, then log base 3 of 9 is 2, right? Because 3 squared is 9. That's the power you'd have to raise e to to get 9. But e is a little less than 3, so you're going to have to raise it to a power a little more than 2. And so if you were to go and calculate this, and the way that you could do that is type in ln of 9 into either your calculator or use Wolfram Alpha, you should get a number that is a little greater than 2. And sure enough, you'll get 2.2 uh, 2 .2 approximately. Okay? And so this is going to be very important because we'll work with this a lot and we'll find that a lot of really interesting um, real-life situations can be modeled uh, with exponential functions where e is the base um, as I said previously, it uh, is the base in situations where we are continuously adding um, a, uh, a certain percentage. And we, can, we will go over that a little more, but you could also look it up if you're curious. Uh, Khan Academy has a really good video on it. Alright, so using the properties of logarithms, you should go ahead and solve uh, these equations here. Uh, you may need to do a few things before you actually uh, use the property of logarithms. And if you don't have a calculator at home, you can use wolframalpha.com. And if you just uh, if you type in, for example, let's say you wanted to find log base 4 of 16, what you would type into Wolfram Alpha is you'd type L-O-G, parentheses, and then you type the base first, 4, comma, 16 like that, and it will give you the value that you must raise 4 to the power of to get 16, which is, of course, 2. And so you can check that that works. Um, 
And you could also, if you were finding the natural log in Wolfram Alpha, just LN and then whatever it is that you are finding the natural log of. If you're using a calculator like a TI-84+, plus, um, you actually want to switch. You write the argument first and the base second. All right, so um, you used your calculator here, and uh, oftentimes it's very helpful to make a couple of manipulations using inverse operations um, quickly and then transforming your exponential equation. So, for example, here adding 4 to both sides, dividing by 5, and then translating your exponential equation uh, to solve for your exponent. Um, and we can do that here for this, this last problem as well. Um, but sometimes you will want to be able to do this without a calculator. You know, say your calculator is broken or maybe there's a question on a test that is testing to know uh, whether you understand logarithms really well. And so you'll need a couple of properties that can be very, very helpful. And in particular, the reason I wrote out this solution here is that there's an easy way to calculate log base 8 of 32. And we're going to talk about that right now. All right, here are a couple of very useful properties. The first is pretty straightforward. If you have the log base b and your argument is y to a power n, you can rewrite this as log base b of y all multiplied by n. In other words, you can pull out the exponent in your argument and write it as just a multiplier of your logarithm. And this can be very, very helpful, and we'll see why in a second. And I want to prove to you why this works. So let's say that you have log base b of y to some power n. Okay, And we'll just say this is equal to x. Okay. All right. Now, we can rewrite this whole equation as an exponential equation. Let's just think about what that exponential equation will be. So the log base b of y to the n is saying, let's find the exponent that you must raise b to the power of to get y to the n. And we're saying that's, that's x, whatever x is. Okay? So we can rewrite this as b to the x power is equal to y to the n power. Maybe take a second, make sure that you understand why we can write that. And so now I'm in an interesting position. Okay? And the position that I'm in is one where I've seen something very similar to this in the past, except that I have usually y equals b to the x. And now I have y raised to the power n. And so what I can do to get rid of this power n is I can raise both sides to the 1 over n power. Okay. And so now I have n to the 1 over n, which is n times 1 over n. Remember, when I have a power raised to another power, I can multiply those together. And so this is just going to be y to the first power. And that's exactly what I wanted. I wanted y by itself. y to the 1. And now I have b. And remember, I multiply the exponent, so I have x over n. Now this looks familiar, right? I have y equals a base raised to a power. And let's rewrite this exponential in terms of the logarithm. So the logarithm says, when we write this in logarithmic form, what we're saying is, what is the power that I raise b to in order to get y? And that power is x over n. x over n is equal to log base b of y. Okay, now notice that I almost have exactly what I started with, right? I almost have x solved for, but I don't quite have it solved for yet. I have to multiply by n on both sides. And when I do that, I get that x is equal to n times log base b of y. So notice that I started out by saying I have log base b of y to the n, 
and that's you know equal to some arbitrary value x and I can go through and manipulate it using the properties of exponents and logs so that I actually can also find that x is also equivalent to n times log base b of y meaning that these two things since they're both equal to x are equal to one another and so if I have an argument where I have something raised to a power I can rewrite the logarithm with the power written outside or multiplying the logarithm. Alright, so let's take a look at this next property. Here we have something that looks kind of daunting, but it's really, really basic and I, I want to explain what it's saying. So if you have log base b of y, meaning you're finding the power that you raise b to in order to get y, it's the same as doing a what looks to be slightly more complicated situation, but as we'll see in a second, can actually really simplify things. Log base c of y, meaning what will I raise this new value c to in order to get y, divided by log base c again, c is the same, where I am finding out what must I raise c to the power of to get b. Okay. So in the big picture of things, what this means is that the power that you must raise b to in order to get y is the same as when you find the power that you must raise some other number c to to get y and divide it by the, the power that you must raise that same number c to in order to get b. And the key here is this introduction of log base c, which is just any number that you choose. It doesn't matter as long as it's the same in both the numerator and the denominator. And that can be very, very helpful because, for example, log base 2 is pretty easy for you to think about, right? So what must I raise 2 to the power of to get, you know, a number like 16? That's very easy to think about. And so we can use common logarithms like log base 2 or log base 10 um, in order for us to more quickly figure out the value of some more complicated logarithms. So let me explain how we go about... Um, proving that this is true, and this one's actually, I think, even more simple. And we'll start, as we normally do, um, with the left side of our equation. We can start with the right, but it's going to be more easy um, and more simple if we start with something that we're pretty uh, used to working with. And so we have log base b of y, and we're going to say that that's equal to some value x. And what I'm going to show is that, look, we can do some manipulations using properties we already know and show that x is also equal to this right side over here. Okay, now by the basic property of logarithms, we can rewrite this equation here in exponential form because b to the power of x will equal y. And we have y is equal to b to the x. Okay, now here is where we're going to make a move that I want to clearly explain. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the logarithm of both sides of my equation. And I'm going to take the same logarithm of both sides. What I do the left side, I must also do the right side. And so if I take the log base c of y, I must also take the log base c of b to the x, right? This is something that we've done many, many times when we have, uh, you know, added something to both sides of an equation, divided something to both sides of the equation, and I want to clearly explain what we did. When I take the log base c of y, what I am finding the value of is what I must raise c to the power of in order to get y. And when I take the log base c of b to the x, I am finding the power that I must raise c to in order to get b to the x, whatever that value is. And I can do that to both sides because I am taking the same logarithm, all right, the same base, to each side of my equation. Now, this is usually a little hazy for, for people, so I want to, again, say where we're coming from. We started with y is equal to b to the x, which means that this value y is exactly equal to b to the x, okay? So imagine that y were some number like 8, for example. We would be saying that 8 is equal to, and 8 is equal to 2 to the third, okay? Now, if I take 
the log base 2 of both sides, I'm going to get the same value on each side. I'm not changing the fact that they are equal. Okay? Because log base 2 of 8, we know log base 2 of 8 is 3. And this is very simple. What must I raise 2 to the power of to get 2 to the third? Well, that's pretty simple. 2 to the third is 8. So 2 to the third will be 8. And so the right side is also 3. Okay. So if I have two values that are equal, when I take the same log of each of them, I'm still going to get the same value. It's still going to be equal. That should make sense. If you don't believe me, pick a couple other numbers that are equal to one another and take the, take the same log of, of both sides. So now, looking at the right side, we can use the property that we just learned to simplify this a little bit. Because if I have log base c and my argument is b to the x, I can move the exponent outside. And so I can rewrite this as x times log base c of b. And on the left side, I have log base c of y. Now we're very close to having x solved for. We just need to divide by log base c of b on both sides. And when I do that, I will end up with x by itself. On the left side, I'll have log base c of y divided by log base c of b, which is exactly what we wanted. And this is very helpful because imagine if you started with something where you didn't quite know, you know, you had really no idea of what you needed to raise b to in order to get y. But it's always easy to think about powers of 2 because those are things that we've memorized. And so we could rewrite log base b of y as two log base 2 situations where I can then calculate or estimate the value pretty easily and come up with an answer. Now, notice the key here is that in order to rewrite this equation, I have to use the same logarithm in both the numerator and denominator, right? That was that key step here. And so I could even use a log base e, or the natural log. And so I'm going to rewrite this to show that we could also use the natural log. So if I have log base b of y, I can rewrite this as the natural log of y divided by the natural log of b. Because here, I'm just saying that I'm going to use e as my base value. Okay. And so basically, I mean, this is um, the general form, and here is just a way of ex us explicitly saying that our base value could be e. Okay, now before we go, I want to... Um, give us the, a couple names that these are referred to. Uh, the first property here is referred to as the uh, power property of logarithms. And the second property, probably the most well-known, is known as the change of base property. And that comes from us saying, look, if you have a logarithm problem where your base is one that you're not good at working with, you can rewrite it as a problem where you can pick the base, and so you can change the base of your logarithms and come up with an approximation yourself. And these are helpful to know um, when we're manipulating functions here and there that, that will come in handy. And I'm actually going to show us, um, you're going to kind of walk yourself through, how this could be very helpful um, in solving one of the problems that you just worked on. Okay, on the left I've copy and pasted the same uh, properties that we just talked about. Um, and here is a question that you worked on just a couple of minutes ago. Now, I'm going to throw in a situation. Pretend that your calculator is broken or that this is a question on a part of a test where you don't have a calculator. So I want you to go through and solve it, but don't use your calculator, meaning try and use one of these properties to make your equation solvable, your situation solvable, without a calculator. All right. First uh, couple of steps are just what you would expect, right? I'm solving for the exponent, the value t, so that's in the exponent, so I want to rewrite this where the exponent is solved for 
5t is equal to log base 8 of 32. Okay, now your next step would be to compute log base 8 of 32, but you don't have your calculator here. So what you'd like to do is find a way to rewrite this so that you can actually calculate it. And if you look at the change of base property, it says if you have log base b of y, you could rewrite it where you pick the base and take the log with that base of both your argument and of your base value. So what number do you know that you can multiply a certain number of times to get both 8 and 32? And maybe it comes to you, maybe it doesn't, but log base 2 will be able to, we can apply to both the argument and the base. So we can rewrite this as 5t is equal to log base 2 of 32 over log base 2 of 8. And now notice that you can figure this out on your own. What is the power that you raise 2 to the power of in order to get 32? Well, 2 to the first is 2. 2 squared is 4, 2 to the 3rd is 8, 2 to the 4th is 16, and then 2 to the 5th is 32. So this value is 5, so we can rewrite this, 5t is equal to 5 over, and log base 2 of 8, 2 to the 3rd is 8, so the value of log base 2 of 8 is 3, and now, to solve for t, I just have to multiply by one-fifth on both sides of my equation. And now I've got t is equal to one-third. And so I can actually solve for it precisely and exactly. And if you go back and you compute log base 8 of 32 and divide by 5, you're going to get 0.3333 repeating. And so the change of base property can be very helpful when we don't know how to compute a logarithm in our heads, but we could compute two different logarithms involving the base and argument um, if we choose the base correctly. Okay? All right. So that is um, a little extension of what you've learned in the past, and I'll give you a couple questions to practice this on. Um, but we're going to move on to a kind of culminating um, piece where we look at the relationship between exponential and logarithmic functions and um, actually graph them out. Okay, consider this function, f of x given by 2 to the x. Let's find the inverse of this function. I encourage you to try that on your own now. This should be familiar, right? So we want to come up with an equation which will take us uh, from our range back to our domain. Right? So, if, for example, if I had some value of 8, I'd want to know what would I have to raise 2 to the power of to get 8. And that would, of course, be 3. So my inverse function would take some value 8 and map to a value 3. And that should sound pretty familiar. That's pretty much the same language um, that we use when we're talking about logarithms. So if we go through, and you remember this process, right? I have some value y is equal to 2 to the x. And what I'd like to do is solve for x. So I can figure out, given a value y, what that x value would have to be. And I can rewrite this using the logarithm, because that, val that exponent x is the power that I must raise 2 to the power of to get y or log base 2 of y. And so we have our inverse, f inverse, and here we've written it as a function of y, as our independent variable, log base 2 of y. And when we rewrite this, though, in function form, we always want our independent variable to be x. So our inverse function is log base 2 of x. And here we just have to remember that for our inverse function, the domain, or all the possible x values, are the range of our original function. Okay? And similarly, right, the range of my inverse is going to be the domain of my original function. So let's actually quickly find the domain and range for our original function f and our inverse function. The domain uh, of our 
original function. Think about it, you could plug in any x value you want and you'll always be able to define a value because 2 can be raised to either a positive or negative value. So this will be all real numbers, right, from negative infinity to positive infinity. And now let's think about the range. So the range of this function are all the possible outputs. Well, remember that 2 to a power, you're never going to get a negative number. In fact, you're never even going to get 0. Because how could you multiply 2 by itself a certain number of times and ever get 0? Right? 2 to the 0 is 1, so we know that's not going to happen. 2 to any negative value is still a positive number. And so the, the range is going to be not including 0. Right? I can never touch 0. We'll see that if, when we graph it. But I can get as big a value as I could ever imagine. So from 0 to positive infinity. Okay. And so now when I'm considering the domain and range of my inverse function, the domain of this inverse is whatever the range values were for my original function. So the domain is going to be from 0 to infinity, and the range is going to be from negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay. So that will help us when we're graphing our function. And now let's go ahead and do just that. All right, I've done my best to create a symmetric graph, uh, symmetric x and y axes, but um, we know that, that I struggle with that. So th this will do a good enough job, but hopefully you can be a little neater than I am. Let's go ahead and graph uh, f of x. We'll graph that in red here. And um, this is pretty straightforward, right? 2 to the 0th power is going to be 1. That's my y-intercept. And uh, if I think about it, you know, when I get to 2 to the 10, that's somewhere way, way up here, right? 2 to the, you know, second power will be 4. So I can do that best job I can, right? 1, 2, 2, 4. 2 to the third power will be 8. And it looks something like this. And as I move to the left, it'll get closer and closer and closer to zero, but never quite touch. Right? Okay. Now, how can we graph the inverse? So there's a couple ways to do it. We can just go by, by and you know plug in some x values, or we can remember the simple fact about inverses. The uh, this function f, if I want to graph its inverse, so this is f of x. If I want to graph its inverse, I just have to reflect it over the line y equals x. So the line y equals x is just a straight line with slope of 1. Right? Meaning it'll go at when x is 10, will be at y equals 10. y equals x. And now when I reflect over, I've got to make sure that I am very careful about how that works. <clears throat> so to reflect a point over a line, you know, I draw that straight perpendicular line uh, to where I'm reflecting it, and then the same distance across. So I can think about all these points, and when I think about this point over here, right, this point over here is going to come down right there. Okay. All these points here, so imagine this point right here, boom, boom. It's never going to quite touch this axis here. This point here will end up right there. And so graphing this in green now, I did a decent job, but not the greatest job. It's going to get very close to that axis. Uh, axis. It's never quite going to touch it. And it will look like that. And we can go through and we can check some of these values by, by plugging in some x values. It looks like when x is 1 here, I'm at 0. And let's think about that. Log base 2 of 1. What do I raise 2 to the power of to get 1? 0. 2 to the 0 is 1. And so it should intersect the x-axis when x is equal to 1. Okay? Will it ever hit the y-axis? No, it never will, and we can see that in the domain, right? The domain, all the possible x values, I can get as close to zero as I want, but I can never have an x value of zero, 
right? There's nothing that I can raise 2 to the power of to get 0. And as I move bigger and bigger values, you know, I'm gonna, it's going to increase, but it's not going to increase exponentially, right? We're finding the power, not the result of an exponent. And so this is how my, my graph will look. And I could do this for, right, for base 3, right? 3 to the x would be log base 3. e to the x, and we're going to look at that one in a second, is going to be log base e, or the natural log. And we can figure out what that graph will look like just by thinking about a reflection over the line y equals x. Okay. The definition now, so I'm just going to do this in general terms. If you have a function, b to the x, then the inverse of that function is log base b of x. Um, the relationship between the graphical version of an exponential and the graphical version, forgot the arrow there, of a logarithmic function, it's a logarithmic function, um, is that you know they're reflected over uh, the line y equals x, and so that's what this is going to look like. Right? Notice here that the y-intercept of the exponential is always at 1, right? unless I have some other thing added on to it. Right? And for the logarithmic, the x-intercept, where it intercepts the x-axis, is going to be when x is 1, because uh, I have to raise uh, any base to a power of 0 um, to get a value of 1. And the domain and range relationships are, of course, as we talked about. And so this leads us to um, an important special case so if you have the function f of x is equal to e to the x, then the inverse of this function, f inverse mm -hmm. of x, is equal to the natural log of x. Okay, And you can take a look at the uh, relationship here. Um, you, I encourage you to go ahead and, and graph it. It's going to look very similar to this, obviously, e to the x, um, and uh, natural log of x. And we're going to work a lot with natural log of x. It turns out to be a very useful function. That is all we've got for today's video. Um, so go back. This one can be kind of confusing, some of the things. So make sure that um, you ask some questions and uh, maybe rewatch certain pieces of it. Uh, and certainly uh, take a look at the assignment.